We are right on track. All this, we're in the middle of a presidential election. We all may be all worried about who's going to be our next president or who's going to be your next boss. I mean, there's so much stuff in our life that we worry about. You might not think things in America are going on right, but we are right where God wants us to be. He is putting America back in a position to reach out to Him again. And we need to do like Joseph. We need to wake up and obey the Lord. So then we begin in Luke chapter 2. We go on, they're talking about more about Jesus' life. Again, this is familiar scripture. It says in Luke 2, it says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year of the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they supposing him to be have been in the company when a day's journey, and they began and they sought him among their kinfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wish ye not know that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spoke unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Have you read that scripture about Mary? She ponders these things in her heart. She don't go run around the church and telling everybody what she sees or what she thinks or what she feels or, or everything. In Mary, and again we're talking about Jesus' mother, several times in the scripture she keeps all these sayings in her heart. She ponders these things in her heart. She was a praying woman. She relied on God. And we should be like that. But it says, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So I titled this next uh, slide, A Child's Choice. Hmm. A Child's Choice. You know, some believe that children should be allowed to make their own decision about religion. Baby, you can serve whichever way you want to serve. You don't have to go to church if you don't want to go to church. You do what, you know, you're, you're on your own person. Oh, no. It's true that every individual has to make a decision whether they serve God and whether they have a relationship with God. But we as parents are responsible for teaching the children God's Word. One of the biggest responsibilities God has given you. And in this scripture, you'll see that even Jesus' parents took that responsibility serious. They proved that righteousness was a central theme in their life. See, they were faithful in practicing Judaism. They were a Jew, okay? Jews were expected to go to Jerusalem three times a year for major festivals. It was the Passover, the Pentecost, and the Tabernacles. And they attended every year. You know, they were examples for their children. They didn't give their children a choice where they went to Passover or Pentecost or Tabernacle or Wednesday night service or Sunday night service or Sunday morning service or you want to go be with your friends. It was their responsibility as parents to teach their children the Word of God. And that's what your responsibility as parents are too. Your children should not have a choice whether they want to get up and go to church or not. If they're living with you and they're your children, they get up and they go to church. Kyler, I get up every, every Sunday morning. You ready to go to church and praise the Lord? You know, I'm teaching him at a young age. I can't tell you what Kyler's going to do when he gets older. He's going to have to make that same decision whether to serve God and serve not. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have taught him the word so that if he chooses not, and I'm not even going to claim that because he's my son, and God said me and my house will serve the Lord. So I know that God has a special calling on his life and in your children's life and everything, but it's our responsibility to teach them. You're going to talk, and we've talked about this, about being an inconsistent Christian. And that's going to affect you in your parenting role. But in this particular 12th year was a very special year. Jesus begins to transition into the son of the covenant. And the Jews still celebrate this with the bar mitzvah. This comes from uh, Jesus and his 12 years old. Jesus had been left behind and Mary and Joseph didn't realize it. Because back then when they traveled, they traveled in these little sort of caravans. And the women and the children went first. And the men and the older boys went 
and followed behind them. So Mary was probably thinking that Jesus was with Joseph, and Joseph was probably thinking that Jesus was with Mary. But then they again began to notice after about a day they couldn't find him. So they began to seek them. And of course, Jesus was back, and he was teaching. And, you know, I got began to understand this. Jesus understood the will of the Father even better than his parents did. Even though Mary and Joseph had this calling on their life to the responsibility to raise God's son, they didn't totally understand all of God's ways. So even if you don't totally understand all God's ways and things that he has in your life, to the best of your ability, you serve God and you follow him and you answer his call. Whatever you need to do. But see, Jesus, he knew the will of the Father. And so he returns to Nazareth, and the the scripture goes on to tell him that he grew, and he grew up with God, and he grew in favor with God, and in favor with men in his life. But I wanted to bring this back in about being inconsistent. It says, how important is it to attend church faithfully in our world today? We're in a dark time in our world. We're in a time where God is not important I love watching the Andy Griffith show and and Bonanza and all these things. You might think I'm old-fashioned. But I love watching that good old-fashioned stuff where Andy, y'all, this is a true story. And David and Justice can tell you because they were over at the house one time. And uh, Brother Cliff says, y'all have got to watch this episode of Andy Griffith. And Justice is like, who? And, um, you know, she's a young and She's like, what? So we turned on Andy Griffith and there's this one little little, um, episode where Andy is having to let Opie fight because this bully has been bullying him. And Andy wants to go and fight that battle for him, but he can't. You know, Opie has to stand up. And so Cliff is sitting there and he's crying. Every, every time he watches that episode, he cries. It's not a lie. Your pastor is tenderhearted. But it goes back to living in a world, though, back in a time when it seems like things was easier. You know, it seemed like God was more of a priority. You know, you you watch shows like that. They were always going to church and stuff like that. Well, you turn on our sitcoms today. The people aren't going to church on Sunday morning anymore. You don't see that. It was sort of a different time. So our world today seems to be growing darker and darker. And it seems like that the people don't rely on Jesus as much as they used to. You know, when you don't have to worry about uh, your food as much and and God has blessed you tremendously and you've got food on your table and clothes on your back, God doesn't seem as important in your life. But it is so important to attend church faithfully because we need God now more than we have ever needed Him before. We need to rely on the fact that the coming Messiah is still coming, that He is still with us. He still has a plan for our life. And we need to be at church to hear the word. We need to be at church when we need deliverance. We need to be at the church when we need healing. We need to be at the church for others. It's not all about us. It's not all that. We need to be in church to stand in the gap for our families and our lost loved ones. We need to be in church to strengthen our relationship with Christ so that when he speaks to us, as he sent an angel to speak to Joseph, we know that that angel was from God. And we know that God was speaking to us. We need church. We need the Word. We need to gather with fellow Christians with a same mind. And in unity, we need to worship. There's so much strength and power in numbers. You think about an army, and I've said it before, I could march single-handedly. And I might make a little noise, because, you know, anyway. But if we all together marched, you know, you could hear. I imagine that if I it was walking down and I was marching, the devil could hear it. Doot, 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 doot. But if all of saving grace was marching in unity, you know, the devil could hear, hey, something's coming. There's a roar coming. You know, there's some power coming. So there's lots of benefits for going to church. I want to speak again about the practical benefits and blessings that coming from living a consistent life of faith. There is nothing more important than being consistent. If you're an inconsistent Christian and you come this month, but you being health and well could have came Sunday night, but don't come, and Wednesday night you could have came, but don't come, first of all, look at your children. What are you teaching your children? It's okay to come every Sunday morning every three weeks, and then you wonder why your kids get into trouble, because you're not teaching them that Jesus is something that i got to have every day. 
I got to have every day of my life. I can't let it go. It's something that I need on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I need it every day. I can't serve a God every now and then. I can't serve a God and only call on him when I need something. I've got to have a relationship with Christ that I've already got a relationship that when I call on him, he knows my name. He said, oh, there's my daughter calling me again, needing me. She talks to me every day. I'm here. I'm here with you. We have to be consistent. Our children need to be seeing us be consistent. You are the biggest stumbling block to your children when you're an inconsistent Christian. You know, if I barely came to church, you know, what would Kyler be thinking? You know, and I talk about, oh, I'm such a good Christian. We only go to church every six weeks, you know, now and then. And you don't teach them the, the right stuff at home. You're letting things be on your TV that you shouldn't be. You've got to be a consistent Christian, not just in the church house, but in your work, in your car, in front of your children, in front of your family. When you're an inconsistent Christian, you're not only affecting your walk with Christ, you're affecting all those around you. I want to be a consistent faithful example. And people might see me fall, but I want them to see me get up, know that I fell, or know that I made a mistake, and that I corrected it. So I want to encourage you today to be consistent in Jesus Christ. Um, we read on that later on in Cliff, <laughs> Cliff's Lord, Lord help me. In Jesus' life, that he is baptized and he is anointed for ministry. And there's, you know, so amazing how when you read the word and you read the same scripture, God begins to reveal stuff to you every single time. You might read that same scripture a hundred times and he'll present it to you in a different way. So as I was reading this from Luke chapter 3, it says, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was open, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. And I'm going to move on over to this. Well, I'll go ahead and read the scripture. Uh, we'll move over to Luke 4. It says, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there out a fame of him through all the region, round about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And it came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And there were delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Preach he hath anoint, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, that he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Listen to what your Lord is being sent to do. To preach deliverance to the captives, to the recovering of the sight to the blind, and set liberty to all those who are bruised. That should make you excited today that that was what your God was sent for you. And to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is the, is the scripture fulfilled in your, in your years. So, going back to the baptism, we know that John the Baptist baptized Jesus. John the Baptist had a very prophetic ministry. And it included the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And we know that uh, Jesus goes to John the Baptist and he wants to be baptized. And John says, oh, I'm not even worthy to lash your shoes. But you know, he challenged hearers to repent and turn from their sinful ways. But Jesus, even though he was sinless, was baptized by John the Baptist, not because he had sinned, but to align him with the people he had come to save. You see, everything Jesus did, he did to be an example to us. He is the ultimate example of what you should do. And we talked about this several lessons ago, about during the baptism, this is one place in the Bible where we see that the Trinity is present. We know that the heavens open, the Holy Ghost descended as a dove, we hear the voice of God, and we have the Son of Man. So the Trinity is present there. But I want you to listen to this, and something that I never realized. Here, the baptism of Jesus Christ has just taken place. An ultimate example of us, something wonderful had happened. You know what happens immediately after the baptism? Jesus um, goes into the wilderness to be tested. Now, something great happens. How often does something great happen in your life that God sends you immediately into a test? 
And this is what happened to Jesus. Immediately he was sent into the wilderness to be tested for 40 days. But don't worry. The anointing that was placed on through the Spirit on Jesus' life sustained him for 40 days of fasting and temptation, enabling him to gain victory. See, he was prayed up. But I just want to remind you that even when good things are happening in your life and you think, man, I just came from an awesome service, and you walk out the door and there's the devil there to test you. Don't worry, Jesus went through it too. Just when something good's happened, a wonderful thing happened, the dove just descended, the Holy Ghost had landed on him, that he hears that his father is pleased with him, things are going good, and then immediately he walks into a battle. So be reminded that oftentimes that happens. And... um. It says that, again, the prophecy is being fulfilled. We're tying in the Old Testament with the New Testament. Isaiah 61, 1 through 2 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening up to the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. So in Luke chapter 4... After that, he comes down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the same day. And notice that when he was teaching these doctrines, they were very astonished, but also that his word was with power. A lot of times when those that were teaching in the temple, they would recite uh, the teachings of other rabbis that had taught them and stuff. But there was a man that was teaching with such power. He wasn't reciting things from other rabbis. There was a difference about Jesus. He was full of the anointing. You know, and what happens when Jesus was teaching is while he was there in the synagogue, there was a man which had the spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we done with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. See, even the devils know who he is. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed and spake among them, saying, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the fame of him went out into every place of the country round about him. Now, we've heard the story about Jesus casting out the devils before, but the people here were saying and showed that his teaching not only came with power, but it came from the authority that even the demons had to flee, that they had to listen to him. You know, now, as I was beginning to read them, there was something interesting that happened. Do you know what happened right after Jesus cast out the devil and he had demonstrated such authority and power? Look at Luke 5 and 16. It says, And he withdrew himself into the wilderness, and he what? Prayed. And he prayed. So Luke 5, what should that teach us about how to respond when we encounter devils, when we encounter spiritual battles? We can follow the example of our Messiah. We can go and we can pray, just like Jesus did. So how do you respond when the devil attacks to you? You pray. And you pray with authority, and you pray with the power that... You have, that God has sent you. And then we begin into John 19. This is where the redemption really comes to play. John 19, 16 through 18 says, Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and they led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha where they crucified him and two others with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. And after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. And now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. And when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished, and he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. And then came the soldiers and broke the legs of the first and of the others which were crucified with him. And when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they break not his leg, again fulfilling scripture, that no bone would be broken. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. 
And he saw that it bare record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he said true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom thou pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arithmetha, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave, and he came therefore, and he took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about a hundred pound weight. And they took the body of Jesus and, wo- and wound him in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the garden where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden a new sepulcher wherein was never a man yet laid. And there laid they Jesus before because of the Jews' preparation day for the sepulcher was nigh at hand." You know, the words of Isaiah and many other prophets regarding the Messiah came to fulfillment in this chapter. I know that was a lot of Scripture, but sometimes it's nice to be reminded of what your Savior went through with you, went through for you. You know, sometimes it's, it's, it's good to be reminded of the crucifixion, not just at Easter, but you know, he's, He is our, our Savior that went through that every, every day. He's the same Savior, not just on Easter. It said this, and I love this, and this was in your lesson. It said, the sacrificial system of the Old Testament had pointed to the day when the sinless Lamb of God would lay down His life to redeem you and me and all of humanity from the death of sin. Your Messiah did that for you. He loved you just as much as He loved those disciples that walked with Him that day. That's the type of Messiah that He is. How could you... I just, I never can comprehend how he could love me so much to go through all of that for me as unworthy as I am and unworthy as we sometimes feel. But that's who we serve. See, Jesus endured the most cruel manner of inflicting death to provide forgiveness for all of human race, for me and for you. He was flogged. He was abused. He was carried to the cross. We know that Simon from Serene helped him. And it began to talk about how, how he was beaten and he had struggled to breathe during that time. Probably became increasingly difficult. But Jesus recognized the fulfillment of the plan of redemption and he declared with these words, It is finished. It meant more than his death at that time. It meant that God's plan for redemption had been accomplished in full. His work of redemption for you and I was complete. But here's the best news yet. It's not the end. Those horrors of crucifixion were not the end of God's plan to redeem you and I. That is not the end. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, who came into this world miraculously in human form as that little baby in the manger, was anointed by the Spirit, He ministered with authority, and He died bearing the sins of the world. But that same Jesus, that same Messiah that we are here today to serve, rose from the dead because death had no power over him. And now through him, you and I are victorious over all sin and all death if you choose Jesus. God never gave up on humanity, and he will never give up on you. You see, God has a plan for you, and his ultimate plan is that you choose Him and that you serve Him and that one day you reign with Him forever in paradise. I don't know about you, but I want to follow God's plan. So let's wake up just like Joseph woke up and let's go about our Father's business in completeness as hard as you can. Serve God with all your heart because God has a plan for you. He still has a plan. Anybody have any questions this morning?